Steve is on our advisory board. He has been a restoration ecologist, would you, we call you? Something like that, for? 40 years. 40 years. He wrote a wonderful book about his introduction to that life, which was called? A Nature Second Chance. Yeah, where he took a piece of land in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And um, gave it a second chance. So um, I'll shut up now. Steve? <laughs> Is that for Steve or for me shutting up? Can everybody hear me without the microphone? Oh, we need to put their taping. Oh, you do? Yeah. I tend to chew on these things. How's that? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, I'm a scientist. And I've had the pleasure of working all over the planet uh, asking stupid questions like, uh, how do healthy ecosystems function? So we've sought out the healthiest forests, Arctic tundra, grasslands, tropical dry savannas, tropical wet forests, various wetland types and, and at large landscape scales. And we've tried to measure, you know, how do these function hydrologically? How do these function from a nutrient balance? perspective? How do these function from a biodiversity perspective? What's happening under the, under the soil? What's soil carbon doing? What's soil nitrogen doing? And so forth. There's not enough time in 18 minutes to take you through a lot. But what I'll tell you is that all of the healthiest ecosystems on the planet that we've measured uh, exhibit these four characteristics. The healthiest ecosystems exhibit diversity at all scales. So the, the, the spatial heterogeneity of the landscape is more diverse. The patch dynamics is more diverse. The genetic diversity, the species diversity, the varietal diversity, the phenotypic diversity. Uh, these healthy ecosystems are also significantly more dynamic. So if there's a period with below average regional moisture and in a normal urban landscape, our lawns would dry up and die. What happens in healthy ecosystems is a whole suite of plant species that step up during those unusually dry or unusually wet periods, and we call that dynamic, uh, innate dynamic capacity. Healthiest ecosystems tend to be more productive as well than any of the agricultural systems, any of the systems that we grow uh, forests on or that we grow uh, corn on. The healthiest examples are far more productive if you measure all the life produced above and below ground. But most importantly, from the perspective of water and from the perspective of nutrient balance and from the perspective of climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the healthiest ecosystems are stingy. What does that mean? Well, it means that they hang on to water and they hang on to nutrients and they are not as freely giving as we are of these precious resources that we uh, dispose of and don't honor we dispose of everything, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is an 1828 watercolor painting hanging in the National Gallery of where I live in southern Wisconsin. It was painted by a doctor traversing the historic prairies and wetlands of southern Wisconsin who painted the billowing smoke plumes off the prairie fires, flocks of whooping cranes, it's much, flocks of whooping cranes, and vast wetlands and savannas. And now this whole area is uh, heavily tile drained and ditch drained, uh, very productive agricultural land. Uh, what we've learned is that the fundamental relationships, and I won't say a lot because you've heard so much about this already, you know, the, the watersheds, the zone of carbonation, carbonaceous material generation, and the rivers, which are the zone of, of, of conveyance of those materials. Uh, and the coastal environments or wetland environments, uh, estuarine environments, freshwater, saltwater, brackish systems, which the zone of mixing, the zone of dilution, this whole complex has been absolutely uh, inverted and, and fragmented, you know, with impervious landscapes, urban environments, compaction, agricultural, fertilizer, climate change, volcanism, the whole, whole range of natural and human-caused and inadvertent and advertent or intentional human-caused changes on the landscape. So here's a few examples. Um, I was a student of Dr. Luna Leopold's. Many of you guys know of Eldo Leopold. And I approached Luna Leopold in 1979 and said, Luna, I'm reading the books of pioneer settlers in Illinois and Wisconsin. And where there's now a river shown on the road map, the highway map, there was not a river historically. 
And he said, oh, yeah, right, you young, inspiring scientists, go find some data. And there's not enough time to take you through it, uh, the data this evening, but we've got a number of publications on it. What we found was that historically, the rivers in Midwestern US and throughout large areas of this country, first and second and many third order rivers, and I won't define what that means at this point, uh, historically had no beds and banks and channels. And uh, this is the last remaining historic channel that we have in the Midwest. Everything else has been so modified. The, the, the prairies and savannas on the uplands graded through imperceptible channels. This looks stagnant, but it's ice cold base water, base flow, groundwater fed uh, uh, stream system full of rare plants and rare fishes in this particular location. And this is what most of our rivers in the Midwest look like now. They're vertically and horizontally uh, entrenched and unstable and dangerous to live near. And I'll tell you a little more about what's happening. You've already heard some of the story, so I'll go quicker. This is the ninth 100 to 500 year flood event on the Mississippi River that we've had in the past 12 to 14 years. You know, that's supposed to have a 1% chance of, of a probability occurrence during every, any given year. And for some reason, we are, we are blowing by that 1% probability chance. Um, what's happening is uh, the stinginess of the ecosystem at landscape scales has been lost. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So the data that I produced for Luna Leopold to gain his trust after my young, ins inspiring presentation to the stately patriarch, uh, he, I brought him a US Supreme Court case that's uh, also in an Illinois Supreme Court that challenged the navigability of most major rivers in the US. And what it basically found in 1904, and again in 1910, that most of the major rivers in the US, including the Mississippi River, were not commercially navigable uh, because the, they, they required channel maintenance to maintain a central channel that would support commercial navigation. So that's about when, shortly thereafter, all the wing, wing dams and channel dredging and all sorts of in, infrastructure work was done. So here's a, a, a watershed that starts up in uh, southeastern Wisconsin where cheese and bratwurst and beer comes from, a place with the Green Bay Packers. Uh, that's a football team for those of you that, uh, <laughs> that, that this river flows down through Illinois uh, and, and confluences with several other rivers and becomes the Illinois River. What is in yellow there is 620 square miles. It's about 428,000 acres in size. This is a duration flow curve, which, which is a cumulative frequency distribution curve that tells you what percent of a year, in this case the year 1899, the water was at or above a particular level of discharge in cubic feet per second. A cubic foot per second is around eight gallons a second. If you went down to the, at the bottom of this watershed, the Des Plaines River right there, in the year of 1899, every morning, and measured the discharge of water coming out of that 620 square mile area, if you read up to the curve and read across, there was about four cubic feet per second coming out of this 428,000 acre watershed. Um, I'm told that that's a, a little bit more than a large pumper fire truck shoots that's trying to put a big, big fire out. I don't know what the truth is. I've never been on a fire truck. But four cubic feet per second was coming out of a watershed that was largely pre-settlement. It was prairie and wetland and savanna at that time. Uh, this is the same duration flow curve for uh, 1973. And I've got another one for 2013 that's not in the show. Um, the, the watershed. Maybe there's a pointer. Hey, hey, I don't have to be tall. We can conquer. Us little guys can conquer. Uh, starting in around 1900, the watershed converted to agricultural practices. Uh, the Germans and the Italians and the Swiss and the Polish and everybody invaded and putting, put it, started putting in, uh, maybe some Slovakians for all I know, uh, came in as well. <laughs> Uh, started putting in under, underground tile systems, which lowered the piezometric surface, lowered the shallow water table, allowed the farmers to get into the fields earlier and have reliable crops. Uh, those, a lot of those landscapes were then converted to suburban 
uh, development in about 1945 through 1950 when the, the World War II military boys came back and suburbs sprang up everywhere. And then large areas have urbanized in this particular watershed. What's now coming out of that watershed, the scale is for some reason cut off on the slide. The 50 percentile, the median value is right here. If you read up to the curve, what's coming out of that watershed now is about 780 cubic feet per second. And it's actually more than that because I've eliminated, I've subtracted all the permitted groundwater uh, discharge, the pumped groundwater that's permitted to be pumped into the river. Uh, I've eliminated that, so it's more than about 1,200 cubic feet per second is coming out of the river. So uh, one of the papers we published looked at the change in high flows, uh, median flows, and low flows in the river. And I can tell you that the, 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 the median flows and the low flows are, are about 400 times, 400 times what they were historically from this particular watershed. And the high flow events are, are roughly about double to triple what they were historically. And these are just simple linear regressions. What we also learned was uh, there's, there was no change in storm intensity, frequency, or rainfall distributions during this period of time. So this isn't as a result of changes in meteorology. This is completely as a result of land use change. Uh, the other thing that occurred, and I'm going to link water and soil now, what we've determined is that the single largest variable, in addition to imperviousness that changed on the landscape, was the change in soil carbon levels uh, from about an average of 9% to 1.5%. What Dr. John Kimball and Ratan Lal and a group of us published was that for every 1% change in soil carbon levels that occurs in soil systems, there's a swing in, uh, of about 60,000 gallons per acre in water holding capacity. And that's a, a statistic in a book called Soil Carbon Management, the group, group of us published in CRC Press in 2009. So 60,000 gallons per acre is held if you increase soil carbon by 1%, and if you decrease it by 1%, the soil no longer has that capacity to hold that. That's the single biggest change. Imperviousness uh, went from 0 to 15% on average through 2014. And agricultural tiling went from 0 to 70% on this landscape. So the combination of those factors has resulted in the significant swing in imperviousness. Now, I've done, now done the same analysis for about 40 rivers in the United States, and in Brazil, and in Argentina, and in Chile, and in, in, in France, and in Germany. And we found exactly, where we can get historic data, we found exactly the, uh, uh, the, uh, very similar relationship occurring in highly altered landscapes. So we started taking what we learned about healthy ecosystems uh, and started saying, well, what if we applied you know, diverse dynamic and, and productive and stinginess back in our design? So we've worked on about 9,000 projects throughout the world. This is one project, a 700-acre development in the Chicago area that's become an iconic conservation community. Uh, I think there were 213 articles about it last year alone that were unsolicited. Uh, it's being widely publicized. Uh, we, we took 70 to 74 percent of the land and have restored it back to prairie and wetlands and savannas. We've got about 180 acres of land that's an agricultural incubator to train future farmers in urban landscapes. We grow food on about 20 acres for uh, about 600 to 800 families as a part of the first, one of the first CSAs in the country. Uh, it's a spectacular project. Uh, we were not able to do multifamily, and we were not able to do higher density uh, zoning and higher density development because the U.S. Supreme Court dictated the zoning and the product type. If you are interested in what orderly annexation is, look up the Heartland Agreement. This was the test case. So we only could do single-family residential development. We did uh, very small clustered lots, 4,000 to 10,000 square foot lots around very large open space areas. We designed everything around a stormwater treatment train where there, we eliminated about $9 million, $9 million in storm sewers, curbs and gutters. Instead of uh, 22 to 28 foot to 32 foot wide roads, 
I'm a pilot, and I land my plane on 20-foot 20, 20 runways regularly, 20-foot wide runways. The wings, can, the wings can hang over. There's no obstructions. Uh, we, nar we narrowed all the roads down to 14 to 21 feet. 14-foot uh, are one-way roads. We eliminated all curbs and gutters. We eliminated all storm sewers. All the BMPs that are typically now talked about are gone. There's no detention pond. There's nothing that's required. We needed 78 ordinance, 70, 78 variances to get this project done. Uh, it's worth it. We saved, uh, we, we say, we saved about 54% on the cost, the upfront cost of the project, and it's, produ it's produced revenues that are 30% greater than competitive marketplace. And that's all very well documented. So the treatment train operates, and this is HSPF uh, um, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling and water quality modeling output showing the treatment train which links swales around the developed neighborhoods to expensive, extensive prairie, uh, and that water then flows into wetlands and then into a receiving water body. Um, the output from HSPF, we've been able to document a 70% reduction in the 100-year storm event, 70% reduction in peak. We've been able to take about 80% of the precipitation that falls on the land during an average year and evaporate it back to the atmosphere. Imagine that. And we've been able to infiltrate about 10% and run, and there's about 10% on an average, on, on, a, on an annualized basis that runs off. Um, what's amazing to me is in urban Chicago, we've got water clarities of 30 to 50 feet. A lot of Illinois people come to Wisconsin where I live to find lakes with that visibility. And, now we've taught them how they can stay in Illinois, for God's sakes. <laughs> and uh, 30 to 50 foot visibility in high colloidal clay soils. So that's a soil where you step on it and India ink, colloidal material comes up into the water column and you can, you know, like India ink doesn't kind of turn clear for weeks or months or years. That's one of the points of India ink. Uh, the clay in this water will stay in colloidal suspension like India ink for weeks and weeks and weeks. So you're looking through 20 and 30 feet of water at high clarity, uh, you know, looking at the bottom. The other cool thing about the water quality from the treatment train is it's so high quality that we have actually moved five endangered fish species. And I'm not talking about world-class, you know, trophy fish, I'm talking about increasingly rare headwater uh, stream fish, uh, star nose, top minnow, minnows, all sorts of amazing fish that are just, just uh, leaving our landscape because of the declining water quality. Here's an 8,000 acre restoration we've doing with the Nature Conservancy, restoring large floodplains. So I just switched projects if you didn't notice. Uh, 8,000 acres of prairie and uh, wetland and savanna. Uh, we're removing huge ditches and tile systems. We're using what I call a Jesus Christ machine. It's got, it's got, it's got eight foot high tires, and they're, they're about six feet wide, and it walks on water as far as I'm concerned. Uh, every 48 seconds, we seed, we seed an acre. Seed rains down from those booms, and we seed an acre. This project is already, we've restored about 4,000 acres of what might become a 75,000 acre site. And this is a stepping stone for reintroduction of whooping cranes into North America. Because the corn belt is a black hole, corn and soybeans, not a real conducive place for whooping cranes. On the Don River in, in, uh -oh, on the Don River in uh, New York, working with Michael Van Valkenburg and others, a major reinvestment in a river mouth in green infrastructure, uh, in, in uh, multimodal transportation and complete recycling of waste, 80% green roofs, this remarkable project uh, on one of the only major river mouth restorations that I'm aware of at this scale. It's just a wonderful project. We did the, the closure plan for Fresh Kills Landfill, the restoration plan for that. That's yet to be done, but we've used the exact same treatment train, and even though the the temperature from the decomposing waste is 168 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's very difficult to build organic matter in the soil on this landfill because it cooks it off, it decomposes it. We've got a plan to grow the right plants that'll produce the organic matter that'll uh, make that site 
uh, a fantastic place for, for rebuilding soil carbon. Uh, rebuilding soil carbon and rebuilding water systems, regrowing water systems and regrowing soil on this planet is, is essentially uh, so foundational to anything we need to be thinking about for food and livelihood and well-being and safety and health and climate. Uh, it, it's just so foundational to that that they have to run hand in hand. You know, the grasslands on the planet and are the most productive systems on the planet. Uh, productivity is correlated with water yield and water use. So if you're going to make water systems healthy again, restoring grasslands, it's not diminishing the value of forest because there's large areas of forest, but there's about four and a half billion hectares of grasslands on the planet that could use a little love and help. Um, I think restoring land, restoring water, restoring soils is about reinvesting in stinginess on the landscape. When I was a little kid, I was taught stinginess was a, was a bad word and bad behavior. It's the right word and it's the right behavior to describe the investment we need to make in ecosystems. And I think with that, I'll shut up. Yeah. <laughs>